happening. Sister has asked me to read this scripture. It comes from Luke 17. Luke 17, 1 to 10. Luke 17, 1 to 10. Then he said to the disciples, It's impossible that no offense should come, but woe to him through whom it might come. It would be better for him if a milestone were hung around his neck and that he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed yourselves if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day, and seven times in a day returns to you, saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. So the Lord said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. And which of you, having a servant plowing or tending sheep, will say to him when he's come in for the field, come at once and sit down and eat? But he will not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper, gird yourself, and serve me till I've eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did things that were commanded of him? I think not. So likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what our duty to do. Amen. May God bless the, the reading of that word and for uh, Chris as he shares it to us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chris. don't need it. That's good. I was wondering what it was. I didn't know. Never, never yet is for doing that. From what I've seen, it doesn't seem to work very well a lot of the time, does it? No. Ah, right. There we go. So, do, I'm going to put this on now. Are we being heard? That's good. Good. Right, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, so you need to put it somewhere. Sorry? No, it's still not working. Not working. Can you? He can't hear me. Oh, okay. Hear it's not working. Sorry? Yeah, it's working. Yeah. Should be yeah, it's should be working. Maybe if we turn up the other way, please. Should we turn up this one? Sorry? Maybe we turn up. Sorry, turn up that way, someone. Okay, how's that? Is that any better? Yeah. Well, the other day, someone said, try turning it upside down. <laughs> now it's echoing, so I'm going to take this thing out. Right, I don't need... Uh, see, it makes it, It's quite nice, actually, preaching from a point of view, as some of you know, I'm quite hard of hearing. Nerve damage in the, in the army left me hearing deficiency. So quite often, I'm sitting in the audience, and it's a real struggle for me to listen to some people speak, especially... You know, Caddickston guys. You know, <laughs> no offence, Danny. <laughs> now, um, I've got a message here. Um, hi, Chris. This is from Ken and Betty. Uh, hi, Chris. We had a lovely time in the South Tenerife Christian Fellowship again this morning, just as we did last Sunday. Please give our greetings to all in Mount Pleasant this evening. So that's from Ken and Betty. So I said... Thank you. We'll pass on your greetings. Glad you're back safe. And they replied, Hi, Chris. Sorry to confuse you. We're not back until Thursday evening. <laughs> so I immediately thought, How much is this text costing me to send? You know, to, to there. All right, there we go. Okay, well, um, the, uh, we're going to go through what uh, the reading from Luke 17, 1 to 10. Now, I'd like to point out that I don't actually choose these readings. I don't choose the topics. Um, they're, you know, Pastor Ken, he puts out the program, and therefore us preachers who get up here, that's what we've got to teach for. And I don't know what Ken's game is with me, but he always seems to give me sort of obscure ones. 
And the one this evening is called The Disciples Inoffensive. Now, you think to yourself, well, what on earth does that mean? And then we have the reading. So I want to start out this evening by saying this. What this really is, this reading, it covers three offenses against God that we are supposed to avoid. But what I want to point out is that, is that for everyone in here tonight, no one should feel condemned. No one should feel con- um, criticized. Because that is not the nature of God. God is a kind person, a loving God. It's the thief, the devil, who comes in to kill, steal, and destroy. So if anyone in here tonight, as I'm talking, feels condemned, that's not from God. If you feel challenged, that's from the Holy Spirit. That's what he does. Okay, so there we go. I just want to point that, point that out now. Now, has anyone watched the film Forrest Gump? Anyone familiar with it? I love that film. And uh, you might remember at a stage in the film where um, Forrest started running, didn't he? He got, the, got a pair of trainers, got them on, started running. And he ran and ran and ran. And when he eventually got to the sea, he turned around and ran back again. And he started to attract vast media attention, running across America from coast to coast. And he attracted other runners, and over this time, it developed into a large crowd. Now, Forrest, he ran in silence, wrapped up in his own thoughts, engaging no one in conversation, but the crowd still followed, finding some sort of purpose in the process. Until one day, after what must have been a couple of years, Forrest stops in the middle of the highway and proclaims, I think I'll be going home now. And that was it. And the large crowd following him became very bewildered and confused because suddenly the purpose they had found Forrest, that found following Forrest, had come to an abrupt end. Now, in our passage this evening, in our reading tonight, I want us to try and step back in time. I, I want you to try and imagine looking or listening to Jesus through the eyes of a Jew, a first century Jew, that all they knew was the law and the prophets. They didn't know the New Testament. We have the benefit of reading the New Testament in in hindsight. So we, we look at the law and the prophets through the eyes of the New Testament and through the preaching of the church. But this reading that we've got today is an encounter of the disciples of Christ, Jewish, who knew no difference. So everything that we're reading, for them, it was brand spanking new. They'd never heard it before. And therefore, we will be covering bits in this where indeed they were very confused about what Jesus said, just as the, disciple, just as the followers of Forrest suddenly became bewildered and confused. So now then, imagine Jesus traveling through Galilee on the way to Jerusalem. Now in the preceding chapters of Luke, up until we get to chapter 17, we are told a large crowd followed him and that he sat and ate with people and that tax collectors... And why, why does this thing keep on... It's what? It's what? It keeps on going boom, doesn't it? Is that better? How's that? That sounds better, doesn't it? Good. A bit disconcerting. Right. So, um, where were we? Yes, so the tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to hear him preach. And that seemingly the Pharisees and other teachers of the religious law constantly found reasons to complain about Jesus and scoff at what he taught. Now, like Forrest Gump, Jesus attracted a lot of attention from all walks of life, following him on his journey. But unlike Forrest, Jesus on his journey had a lot to say 
about a lot of life's issues, and often under the guise of parables, and other times just plain straight talking. And so it's under this backdrop that we come to a passage today in Luke, where straight talking is prevalent. So we're going to take this in three parts. So we're going to take the first part, and that is, one day Jesus said to his disciples, things cause people to stumble, or things that cause people to stumble are bound to come. They're inevitable. But woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourself. Now, I would consider that quite straight talking. There's no beating around the bush. There's no parable. It's quite straight talking. So I'm calling this the first offence. We are warned to avoid in this passage. And that first offence is that leading others astray. Now, Jesus tells us trials and temptations are inevitable. Things cause us to stumble. It's a condition of every human on planet Earth. When we see, smell, hear or touch something, that is when the seed of desire sets in. Jesus spoke about it in his parable of the seeds in Mark chapter 4, when he said, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. So we're not talking here about the desire for a biscuit to dunk in your morning tea. We are talking about sinful desires that are within us all, or that we are susceptible to. The Bible calls it sinful desires of the flesh. Colossians chapter 3 verse 5 sums it up quite nicely where it says, we are to put to death whatever belongs to our earthly nature, i.e. sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Now that's interesting because as we go through that list there, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires. And then suddenly we have this word greed. Now, if we sort of looked at all those things there, which would we say is worst? Sexual immorality, promiscuity, impurity, lust, evil desires, we would have put those as probably the worst sins. But what Jesus does here, he says greed, which is idolatry. Now, anyone who has read the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, will realize that the biggest problem of the Jews in the Old Testament was idolatry. It was putting something before God. It was worshipping something before God. So what is greed? Well, greed is the desire for excess. The desire for things we don't really need, like the replacement of something that doesn't really need replacing. In affluent countries where money is not an object to most people, greed and desire drive the economy. Now, I remember as a well-paid school teacher, I never thought twice about replacing old for new, even though the old would do. And it's only in recent years when I found myself on somewhat of a lower income and I had to start watching the pennies and I then realised what I used to do. Now the, the Bible calls greed idolatry and I think we should take careful appraisal of our motives when considering the new thing to buy. Could it be construed as idolatry? So we're all susceptible to trials and temptations as individuals. And we are called to deal 
with them personally. I say again, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. He knows it. But what if we make these desires and temptations to lead little ones astray? What if that happens? Well, in John 13, verse 33, Jesus at the Last Supper referred to his, his disciples as his children. These were grown men, and he called them my children. He used the term children many times in the Gospels, referring not to just to little children, but also big children. In becoming Christians, we are adopted into his family and given the right to be called children of God. So the offence against God and an individual is leading any fellow Christian astray and away from God, particularly through false teaching or deliberately causing them to stumble into sin, i.e., saying, yeah, that's fine, it doesn't matter, go ahead. The penalty for doing so is a mafia-style assassination of being thrown into the sea, chained to a large weight to drag you down to the depths. And Jesus clarifies the point by saying, so watch yourselves. It's quite interesting, isn't it? It's quite moving, you know, the, you know it's just... I've never heard, I don't think there's many places where Jesus speaks so, so sort of vehemently against something, but here it is. So it would seem appropriate to make a point here about what is false teaching. Now, there are many examples of, of this raised in the New Testament, and you can look them up. You can Google it, you'll find them. And we live in a world where anything goes. Controversies on religions are prevalent. Controversies on what's right, what's wrong are prevalent. But as Christians, we have one book amongst many that we must adhere to, and that's the Bible. The Bible tells us what we must and must not do. For example, we must repent, turn to God, and have faith in Christ. We are called to a life of good works, guided by the Holy Spirit. We must do what is right, show constant love, and live humbly with our God. When it comes to teaching, if we err from the Bible, or what is taught in the Bible, then we are on seriously dodgy ground. Now, I've been there. I've been in my walk of faith of over 30 years. You know, as a science teacher, I ask questions. There have been times when I questioned the whole creation. When I, there have been times when I've doubted God. Did he really mean this? I watched BBC documentaries about the flood and, and other things. Did they really happen? But what brought me really back is once you start doubting one bit of the Bible, then you start cherry-picking what's written there. And once you start cherry-picking, whoa, what's right, what's wrong? So I came to the conclusion, as a Christian, we've just got to follow the Bible. Don't take a risk. Now, in the church, God has appointed elders and deacons. So... If we know, don't know about something or are unclear about something, God has appointed people in the church to help with clarity on issues. And I've got to say, in my year of being here, you know, people from this very church have been drawn away through false teaching, ignoring the sound advice of its leaders. Now, I, I firmly believe that they're on a journey. And God is with them. God says, I will never forsake nor leave you. It's not them that I'm so concerned about. What I would be more concerned about is about the people who have led them astray. And it, they will have to answer to God for this. But it's not for us to judge them. 
The truth is this. If you want to get right with God, you must turn to Jesus for salvation. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one but no one can come to the Father God except through Jesus. Amen? Amen. So, moving on in this passage, as Jesus did, we come to the what I call the second offense. And this one's all about forgiveness. <coughs> or rather, the offence of unforgiveness. If your brother or sister sins against you, you rebuke them. If they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day, and seven times comes back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. It's interesting. Um, I had an incident to talk to a non-Christian recently, who was complaining about somebody. And I said, well, you know, the, the best way to deal with this is to talk to them. Well, we have talked to them, but they keep on doing it. Well, yeah. But you can only forgive someone so many times. That's the worldly view. That's how most people think. But that's not what Jesus says here, is it? Remember I said the Bible tells us what we must do? Well, this is one of them. Forgiveness towards a repentant brother or sister in Christ is compulsory. It's not an option. We are called to help each other in repentance by, when we feel a fellow Christian has sinned against us or has done something wrong, we must gently and lovingly point it out in private and then we keep quiet about it. And we don't go repeating the incident in gossip. It's also spelled out in Matthew 18, where it talks about a uh, difference with a fellow Christian. You talk to them directly. You don't go straight to the leadership. Now, rebuking somebody is an act of enabling an individual to correct their behavior so that they please God. It's not about getting an apology out of them so that they prove their guilt of singing against you. We all make mistakes. My goodness. How many of us can remember being in arguments and you come at loggerheads with the other person? I'm not going to say sorry first. They have to say sorry first. We've all done it, haven't we? You know? because that's something that I'm going to talk about in a bit. We all make mistakes. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And none of us are perfect. We are all a work in progress. And quite often it is not the other person that is actually sinned against us deliberately. It is more common that we simply take offence at something they said or did, or texted, or emailed. We get upset or hurt over what is usually nothing more than a misunderstanding. Now, I know that I can sound a bit abrupt sometimes. And that has upset people in the past. But I'm not doing it to upset people. It's just the way I talk. I'm an ex-army man. I say what I mean and I, say, and I mean what I say. That's how I spoke in the army. That's how we all spoke. You know, I don't sugarcoat my words and sprinkle marshmallows on the top, which, as I found out, doesn't go down well with the more sensitive types. But I've learned, and I'm still learning, to try and be a bit more sensitive, you know, try and see the outcome of my words. But I found a good question to ask myself if I become upset. And it's this. Did the other person deliberately set out to offend or upset me? Or am I simply being oversensitive? Did they do it on purpose? And 99 times out of 100, no, they didn't. We simply got upset or become, became offended. We took offense at what they did because we felt it was something against us. So 
let's talk on the other side. What are the obstacles against unforgiveness? Do, you know, have we ever felt it difficult to forgive someone? Have we ever felt a grudge against somebody for something they did to you? I have. From, from things that happened years and years ago. You know, I don't know that I've ever forgotten what they did because they were really hurtful. What about these statements? You hurt me and now you're going to pay for it. You broke my best vase left to be by my mother. You just don't care. I hate you. How can I ever trust you again? They're just a few little statements that I'm sure all of us have probably felt at some time or another. But common to these statements are feelings of hurt and anger. Now, we can't always help the way we feel, but we have a responsibility about how we express those feelings towards others. Now, yes, people can say or do things that hurt our feelings and make us angry. And some of you are probably expecting me to say now, just take it to the foot of the cross and leave it there. That's been said to me before, as if it was a Christian cure-all. It's very easy to say that when you're not in the, that situation. And I have to say, it wasn't very helpful. It isn't that easy when you're hurt or angry. But what God promises is, he will be with you through the pain. He doesn't promise to take the pain away. No. Hurt and pain caused by others doesn't go away overnight. It takes time and sometimes a long time, if ever. Jesus simply says this, mourn with those who mourn and in your anger do not sin. Feel the hurt, feel the anger, feel the pain, but do not sin. And in time, if you allow him, God will help you overcome those feelings and even bring you to the point of forgiveness. And always remember the final words of Jesus on the cross. And if you remember the stoning of Stephen in the book of Acts, both of them at their point of death were able to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And if we can learn to say those words about people who have wronged us and we have become upset or angry with them, then maybe that's a possible way forward for forgiveness. Now, that's two offences. First one, leading people astray. The second one, the offence of unforgiveness. But before we look at the third offence in this passage, we need to take a little detour. It was back in Luke chapter 9, verse 51, that Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And chapter 10 records how, passing through Galilee, he sent out the 72 disciples. We've had teaching for seven chapters on all sorts of topics in different places and in different towns through Galilee. Faithfully, faithfully recorded by Dr. Luke. And so far in our passage today, Jesus gets down to the nitty-gritty of what's in every one of us. Trials and temptations, forgiving others regardless. Now I'm asking you to Im imagine yourself as one of those Jews back then. If you imagine, if I imagine myself as one of the disciples back then, I, I've had so much radical teaching for so many months, however long it was, walking through, following Jesus, that seemed to turn the Old Testament laws on its head. As a Jew living in that time with the Pharisees and teachers of the law breathing down my neck all the time as I followed Jesus, I think I would have felt someone under a lot of pressure. Is Jesus right or are the Pharisees right? So it's not surprising that the apostles might suddenly blurt out in verse 5, in the midst of all going wrong, 
increase our faith. Now, I appreciate the commentary of notable theologians who think this statement to the who link this statement to the preceding verses in that the apostles were asking for more faith to forgive others because it was so radical from an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth in the law. And certainly the whole important topic of faith is worthy to include this verse in a sermon by itself. But I feel the reply of Jesus could imply a different slant on the occasion. We've got some exasperated Jewish disciples, apostles, increase our faith. How much more of this stuff can we take? And Jesus casually replies in verse 6, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. What an answer. What an answer. What a profound reply. The whole issue of faith is one enormous topic. It is the basis on which all Christians are called to live. It wasn't the case that the disciples didn't have faith here. They just wanted more of it to cope with the situation that they were in. Jesus did not directly answer their question. Instead, he used the metaphor of a mustard seed. Now, a mustard seed is very small, the little black things, if ever any of you have used them. But the point is, I don't know if any of you have done it, they do it with primary kids. They put mustard seed on a bit of cotton wool and they water it and they grow. That means these tiny little seeds are alive. They just need watering. And they're almost invisible at first. They're so small and they're hard to see. But the seed will germinate underground and begin to spread. First, under the ground. When the time is right, it bursts through the soil and the first stage of the plant has become visible and begins to grow visibly. That's how our faith works. New Christians, people come into faith, that, there's just that seed there. But it's not visible to anyone else because we're asking questions. Is this right? Is this wrong? Is this real? We don't know. Jesus, Jesus was saying that the amount of faith is not as important as the right kind of faith. That is, having faith in the one and only living God. Like a tiny seed, a small amount of genuine faith in God will take root and grow. Although each change will be gradual and imperceptible, soon this faith will have produced major results that will uproot and destroy competing loyalties within us. We don't need more faith. A tiny seed of faith is enough if it is alive and growing. And I might add in here, ad lib, how do we make sure that that seed of faith in us is alive at grow? I remember the analogy once, RPG. Anyone know what RPG stands for? Rocket propelled grenade, kills off armored vehicles. RPG, R, read your Bible, P, pray, G, go to church. It's our weapon against the enemy. That's how you take that si tiny seed of faith and let it grow. And incidentally, the reference to the mulberry tree, that is a black mulberry tree now, they can live for hundreds of years and have a vast root system making them very difficult to uproot. And maybe in his answer, Jesus was saying to his disciples, just a tiny seed of faith in me is enough to resist the teachers of the law and the Pharisees who were the mulberry tree. So after this little detour, it was two, just two verses, but there was a lot in there. Jesus then moved swiftly back to his dialogue. And I'm calling this the, the third offense. 
And that is one of self-justification. Jesus says, suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants, we have only done our duty. Time check. Sip of water, excuse me. <laughs> Four little verses. When you've done everything you can, you've only done your duty. These four little verses bring out and challenge a part of us that is so prevalent in all of us. It's the issue of pride. One could say in reply to these verses, but what about my rights? I deserve to be better treated. I might be a servant, but I'm still a human being. I at least deserve a thank you or some sort of recognition. Isn't that what is in all of us to a certain degree? Isn't that like the world that we live in today? It's all about the rights of an individual. It has been said that children's rights are important and the rights of children are important and rightly so. The problem is that society has disregarded the word that complements the rights of an individual. And that word is responsibility. And as a teacher, I used to say to my pupils, yes, yeah, sure, of course you have rights when they decided to use them, but you have an obligation to exercise those rights responsibly and in a responsible fashion. Rights and responsibilities go together. But what about this self-justification? What makes us demand our rights? What is it? Well, I've put together something about pride. Pride resides in all of us. It's the thing that drives our, des our desire to be rightly treated. And if we are not treated rightly, pride rears its ugly head. So, for those taking notes, I've put together an acronym that can help us to see what pride really is all about. An acronym, by the way, sorry, it's where you take a word and then you use the first letters of the word to, do, to make other words out of them, okay? It was at this point that I was asked this morning, do I have anything on the wall? And I said, no, I could have done, but I thought, no, if people are taking notes, they'll just dip, take them down. But you can always get these from me afterwards anyway. So I'm going to go through this, what pride is. The first letter of pride is P. And it tells us that pride is persuasive. It convinces us that we are right regardless. It is self-justification. It convinces us that we are right and the other person is wrong. We are right and the other person is wrong. Sounds like it might be an obstacle to, for to forgiveness, mightn't it? The second letter of pride is the letter R. And R stands for resistance. Resistance to the sound advice of the Bible. Resistance to sound advice from elders in the church. Resistance to the rebukes of loving brothers and sisters who inform us we are wrong. Resistance to challenges by the Holy Spirit. The third letter is I, 
PRI. And I stands for invasive. It controls us. It controls our heart, it controls our mind, it controls our soul. We are called to love the Lord our God with all our heart and mind and soul. And it's the eye in pride that overrides that function. It takes over our heart, mind and soul. It's invasive. The fourth letter of pride is D. And D stands for destructive. It is the thing that destructs relationships. It is the thing that prevents forgiveness of others. It is the thing that destructs or can destruct the body of the church. And finally, the fifth letter is E, and it stands for a word endemic. Endemic is often referred to diseases. Like, for example, malaria is endemic to Western India. It's a disease. Pride is an ongoing infection amongst humanity. It is something that we can never be rid of. We can only learn to develop to control it, like a vaccine controls a virus. And at that point, it sounds a bit like a hopeless situation, doesn't it? What are we going to do? But that's the point. At the end of the day, we should only ever really say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. We can't earn our way into heaven. Back in Micah 6 verse 8, it says, live humbly with your God. God has done it all in his son, Jesus Christ. He knows our condition. And when it comes to God's standards, we are weak, ineffectual, inadequate, and unable to save ourselves. We all fall short of the glory of God. And we like to think we can manage, but in the end, we can't do it without him. We are defenseless. We like to think we've got everything under control, but actually, when the crunch comes, we realize we can't manage on our own. More people become Christians when they are in such desperate need. The scriptures say that when you are weak, God can be strong in you. And it's only when you're on your knees in desperation that you cry out to God for help. And it's then that the Holy Spirit steps in and points the way to Jesus. But today, you don't have to wait until you're on your knees in desperation. I stand at the door and knock into your life, says Jesus. Let me in and see the joy I can bring into your life. Now, I ain't saying that walking with Jesus is easy. All I can promise you is, as the Bible tells us, you'll never again walk alone. To conclude with this, I'm going to finish this. I'm going to finish with this. And when I say to conclude, it only takes about a minute. All right? <laughs> <It's> right. <laughs> Listen to these words. Where there is Jesus, where there is sin, there is always Jesus. Seeking to forgive and recover all the damage it has caused. Jesus is at home in human failure, drawn by it, knowing what to do about it. For he in himself and in his blood is the answer to it all. The Christian will be saved and dwell safely because Jesus will stand for him and her, answering every accusation against him and her, becoming their surety and righteousness. Jesus said, I am. Jesus is God. I am. And I am is bread seeking the hungry, joy seeking the sad, Fullness seeking emptiness and the fulfillment of his children's needs. 
Are we going to have a last hymn? Good. So I just want to leave this with you. If you're hungry, if you're sad, if you're feeling a bit empty, then at the end of this last hymn, just come and ask me or somebody at the front for prayers. Don't walk out of this church hungry, sad, or empty, because Jesus is going to fill it all. Thank you for listening.